Good morning. Hello, everyone. I see everyone, folks. Finally, Good morning. In my name. Good morning. How you doing? Nice to see you again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Juan Pablo, Michael, Daniela. Good morning, Santiago, guys. Ruben. Hola, hola. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, happy Monday to everyone. Um, hope you all had a nice uh, Fourth of July holiday for those who, be, who are U.S. based. Uh, we're so pleased to be back. Um, and with a very exciting topic today, we're going to be speaking about tokenization, um, but in a new a way that perhaps you may not have heard it spoken about before. So we're really uh, thrilled uh, about today's coffee chat. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Lindsay Lear. I am the Managing Director of Payments and Commerce Market Intelligence. We've been running these. This is our fourth year running. Uh, twice per month, we do these informal sessions as a way to promote our mutual learning about the payments industry, primarily in Latin America, uh, with different speakers and different topics every time. So welcome back. Um, you'll notice that a lot of folks have their cameras on, have their mics open. This is not a traditional webinar. We really encourage uh, open participation from all of you. So we encourage you to ask questions throughout the session or write comments. You can raise your hand. You can jump in. You can uh, put a comment in the chat, however you feel most comfortable. We want to hear from you. We want you to add to the conversation. You bring as much value as we do uh, in these sessions. So, so let's go ahead. Um, quick legal notice, which we show uh, every week, and just a couple of guidelines uh, to ensure a successful session this morning. If we go ahead, um, we are recording this session, and these do uh, get published to our PCMI YouTube channel, okay? So just mind your comments, um, and, and keep in mind this is an open forum. Um, treat it like you would um, any typical in-person forum where you might have competitors, you might have investors, you might have members of the press. And so, you know, just keep that in mind. Again, we want you to participate. Um, and uh, we always get questions, are, will the slides be available um, after the session? And the answer is yes. Um, and actually, if we go to the next slide, I want to once again, invite you all to sign up for our brand new uh, intelligence portal, which is prior, you know, prior to about a couple of weeks ago, we were saving all of our coffee chat decks on our website, but we've migrated all of our thought leadership, all of our content into this singular portal uh, where you can sign up with a username and password, access all of PCMI and AMI content going back to 2018. There's a dedicated spot for our coffee chat. So signing up, you not only get our coffee chest, all of our white papers, all of our articles, all of our webinars, all of our content, you can search for data. Um, so I encourage you, we'll throw the link in the chat as well as this QR code. Um, this is a free service right now. Um, as it grows, uh, that, that, that may change, but right now, for you guys, especially, we haven't even launched this to our wider network. It's really available only to our coffee chat and, and a few you know friends and family of the house. So uh, we want you guys to experiment with it and start accessing the content via this channel. So I encourage you guys to take advantage of that um, while it's freely available to you all. Okay. All right. So um, let's go ahead. We'll throw that link in the chat as well in case you missed it. Uh, but moving right into our content, I'm so pleased um, to welcome Arnoldo Reyes, my old good friend. Uh, Arnoldo, I think we met back when you were at PayPal uh, a couple of lives ago. Many lives ago, um, yes. You've gone, you've gone through a few evolutions, and now you find yourself at one of the most interesting and exciting fintechs out there. I'll let you formally tell the group about Paxos and your role there, but but welcome. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Well, thank you, Lindsay. It's uh, great to uh, to be here and uh, surrounded by uh, what seems to be many uh, old colleagues uh, and friends. Fantastic, fantastic. So uh, what, what we'll, we're gonna, I'm gonna give it right over to Arnoldo today. Uh, we're going to be speaking about tokenization. And you, you know, when I say the word tokenization, um, probably what comes to mind is Apple Pay or, you know, card on file. And this is technology that's been around for a long time. Um, nothing that new or exciting about it, but we are going to be speaking about a kind of a new definition of tokenization, new evolution of tokenization, which really stands to, you know, we, we've heard a lot in really the past two years with, with the rise of blockchain, um, the, the revolution and, and, and evolution of our financial system. And, and tokenization is just one of these technologies. One of the flavors or one of the implications of blockchain technology that is enabling 
new use cases and new possibilities in payments. So I'm going to let Arnoldo really um, tell us about this. And I really encourage, you know, this is probably a topic that's new for many of us. So I really encourage a lot of questions from, from you guys. I'll be asking questions. Um, so, so Arnoldo, please tell us, you know, tell us about Paxos and tell us about, you know, I'll, I'll give it, I'll give it over, over to you to, to walk us through your content. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot again for having me and, and good morning to everyone from a very Spartan decorated WeWork in Mexico City this morning. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, and I'll just give a little bit of intro in, into Paxos, um, but also a little bit of intro on myself. Um, so my name is Arnoldo Reyes, and I've been uh, working sort of at the intersection of technology and financial services for, for a very long time. Uh, and in payments for, geez, it, it seems since the invention of the abacus, uh, but really have been through a bunch of different cycles over the last uh, 20, 24 years or so. And one of the areas that, um, you know, if you're in financial services in general, that's certainly uh, driving a lot of curiosity, interest and capital over the last couple of years, it's certainly blockchain infrastructure, blockchain technology. Um, and it's important sometimes to sort of differentiate crypto and blockchain. Um, and really, I think that, you know, uh, companies like Paxo certainly are leveraging blockchain infrastructure uh, for much more than just crypto, right? Um, and that's where I think really the opportunities are. Um, so just a brief background on Paxos. Uh, Paxos is a regulated blockchain infrastructure platform. Um, and what that means is that uh, we develop uh, products and solutions on top of blockchain infrastructure uh, that is fully regulated. Um, and we essentially have three sort of big business lines. One is crypto for enterprise. So we offer crypto brokerage, uh, more commonly known as crypto as a service. And, and we're, we've earned the right to work with very good companies globally, such as interactive brokers, PayPal, Venmo in Latin America. We power sort of the, the crypto uh, services for New Bank, Mercado Libre, and PicPay, and a few others that, that we'll announce shortly. Um, and then we have our stablecoin and payments, uh, you know, line within the enterprise solution, which is how do we move money um, or move value, uh, particularly leveraging, leveraging regulated stablecoins. And there's obviously a ton of different use cases for, for the movement of digital value around the world, everything from re remittances uh, on a cross-border uh, level, all the way to uh, freelancer payouts, uh, creator payouts, supplier mm -hmm. payouts, et cetera, right? So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's pretty big. Then we have sort of our, our crypto for investors lines, um, which is really sort of USDP, um, our regulated US dollar stable coin and our Pax G, which is our tokenized gold. And we'll talk about that one a little bit more. And then we have our, our settlement business, which is essentially settlement services for institutions um, where we do equity settlements for broker dealers and we do precious metal settlements, right? So as you can see, Paxos is much more than just like, crypto as a service, right? Um, and, and I think that, you know, part of what, what drives a lot of the curiosity um, towards Paxos and, and companies like Paxos um, is this whole concept of, of tokenization, which we'll talk about. And really, when you think about tokenization, um, you know, for all us uh, payments people, uh, I think you kicked it off well, Lindsay, when you said, well, tokenization has been around. Yes, um, we won't be talking about sort of card on file tokenization or the any of those tokenization protocols that essentially abstract a cr the credential data away from a transaction. And that's certainly, I think, uh, a key piece that has played a, a sort of a, a very important role in the evolution of, of digital value and payments. Uh, but we'll be talking about tokenization of assets, right? And how we view tokenization of assets um, as a key driver, as one of the key drivers at least, um, in opening the world's financial system. So that's that's kind of in a nutshell what we'll be what we'll be discussing today. Perfect. And when you another when you say regulated entity, um, is that in the U.S.? Can, can you just speak to that a bit? You know, that's a cr critical element, right? And so, um, uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, Paxos is over ten years old, uh, first of all, and. Um, our founder comes from traditional finance, um, you know, having been at Goldman Sachs and a few other sort of bulge bracket banks in the past, um, the sort of the vision early on was to essentially open the world's financial system to everyone. But obviously that, that's, that's a, a very uh, ambitious vision. And, and there's sort of being pragmatic, there's a couple steps 
Paxos and other companies need to take. And one of them is getting regulated. And I always tell people this over the years, I'm, anytime you touch what's most intimate to people, which is their money, right? Or anything they, they hold as value, um, you better make sure you're regulated, right? And so very early on, sort of um, uh, Chad Cascarilla, our, our founder and CEO, had this vision of if we are going to win long-term, let's invest um, you know, resources and capital uh, and putting policies and procedures in place to be a fully regulated company uh, in the US and in other markets. So in the US, we've been regulated as a, as a trust company since 2015. Um, we are supervised by the New York Department of Financial Services. Uh, we have you know, compliance teams, uh, obviously legal teams, but we have a whole infrastructure that's meant to make sure that in a way we operate sort of like a bank, right? With very strict compliance controls uh, in place. And, and that's critically important because when we hold customer assets, right? We're in a way acting almost like a bank. We're holding things of value on behalf of someone else. Um, and what you want in that case is someone that is regulated, right? That, that meets uh, very high standards for taking custody uh, of digital assets in our case, right? Uh, we are regulated in the US and then we also um, over the last couple of months obtained a, a license from the Monetary Authority of Singapore and obviously looking to get regulated in, in a lot of other jurisdictions. But I think the fact that we are a regulated blockchain infrastructure uh, undoubtedly has played a key role in working with some of the companies that I mentioned that are um, you know, very big US publicly traded companies like, like Newbank, Mercado Libre, PayPal, interactive brokers, et cetera, right? Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Great. Well, let's great. thank you for that intro. Let, let's move ahead um, into the discussion. Yeah. So, so, so kicking it off, I think if we, if we you know, think for a second about the, the landscape today and how the financial system is built, um, no doubt that it's, it's done wonders over, over centuries, really, right? Since, um, since sort of like modern history commerce existed. But when we sort of take a step back today, one, we realize that there's a lot of assets around the world that today are locked, right? Uh, that people own, corporations own, investors own, governments own, that are pretty much you know, locked and there's limited utility, right? Um, so it's sort of like the, the analogy here is like you know, this bridge in France where everyone puts quote unquote love locks and you, in theory, you can't take them off, right? So uh, it, it's, it's kind of that similar concept, which is you have assets that cannot be easily moved around or have limited utility. The second is exclusive access. And, and here it's like over the, over the last 30, 40 years, right? We've made tremendous strides in you know, driving you know, digital inclusion, which eventually helps drive financial inclusion. Um, and we've seen swarms of companies sort of going after and trying to get people sort of at the bottom of the pyramid to move up. And, and we've seen uh, this continuous digitization of payments. Um, we've seen obviously companies like Paxos that are introducing new asset classes in a very easy, safe and reliable manner, uh, but it's still very exclusive, right? Um, and um, I remember when I was at PayPal, Dan Schulman used to say this all the time, uh, being poor is expensive, right? Uh, so I think the, the financial system still needs to sort of like, you know, open or, or unclip the velvet rope uh, because it's still for many people, hundreds of millions of people still very hard to access anything from a digital payment to you know, a $50 loan to, to restock their little convenience store, right? And then there's the issue about uh, systemic inefficiencies. Um, you know, we, we've, we've uncoded the human genome. We're sending tourists to space, but it still takes three days to get a wire transfer from New York to Mexico City. Um, there's something wrong. <laughs> um, and I know, again, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that are evolving um, and if we take a look at even 10 years back, the ability for, I don't know, a merchant in Mexico City to accept the digital payment was impossible, right? Now it's like download an app and you can start receiving payments on your phone. Um, or you want to move uh, um, dollars between one market and the other. You could do that instantly now with regulated stable coins. Um, but there's still a lot of systemic inefficiencies, right? And I think um, in a weird way, we are sort of to blame, right? Anytime you have sort of humans doing things, uh, it, may, it may add unnecessary friction to processes, right? So, so again, I think there's, there's our financial system, despite the incumbent companies and a ton of money that you know, fintech and digital commerce companies have done over the years, we still have a lot of the world's 
un assets underutilized, it's still very exclusive. Like fin accessing financial services is still pretty hard for hundreds of millions of people. And there's still a lot of inefficiencies sort of running through the pipes, right? So that's sort of like setting the context. Um, if you go to the next slide, when we think about, you know, what, what like tokenization really does, it really helps us reimagine the concept of value and digital value, right? And in that process, I hate to use this word, um, I considered it taking off the slide, actually democratize is way overused. Um, hopefully someone on this webinar comes up with a new word, a new buzzword, but um, you know, in the process of um, converting assets to digital forms, right? Um, we're able to truly open up the market globally and we're truly able to democratize certain asset classes to people uh, that otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have uh, had access to them. So um, one, sort of on the left, like what exactly is tokenization, right? And there's so many different, um, I think, versions and varieties and flavors of tokenization. And certainly we're not talking about sort of tokenization in the traditional payments sort of world, uh, where I, again, it's all about masking a payment credential and, and all of that stuff. Tokenization, as we look at it, um, and when it's associated more to blockchain, really is about how do you take a real world asset and represent that digitally, right? Um, and we're not necessarily talking about like uh, images of apes dressed in, you know, Navy regalia. We're talking about how do you take, you know, real world assets, real estate, and a bunch of other assets we'll talk about soon, and just represent those digitally on a, on a ledger, right? Which is the blockchain. Um, and those assets can be tangible, right? Uh, they could be a farm in Big Sky, Montana, um, or they could be, um, you know, a warehouse in Panama. Um, so those assets can be real world assets. You can touch and see them, or they could be intangible assets, right? Fixed income, securities, um, you know, art, whatever, you know, digital art or whatever, whatever those, those, the form factor of those assets become. And third, it's really, tokenization is really about giving global and instant accessibility to just this complete scores of different asset classes, right? So in the end, if there's one thing you take away from this session, it's tokenization is really converting real world assets and giving them a digital sort of form, right? And how does it work? Well, um, you know, this is kind of like, how is the sausage made? It's much more complicated than this, um, but essentially in sort of the step one, it's really about deciding, um, you know, what asset you want to tokenize. And this could be obviously like, institutions deciding to, to, to tokenize, or it could be public sector entities deciding to tokenize. Obviously we, you know, being a, a LATAM focused webinar, we've seen everything that's going on in Brazil, which is super exciting. Um, we're thinking about tokenizing deposits and thinking about tokenizing their currency and things like that. So the first step is really about deciding what asset to tokenize. And when you're deciding what asset to tokenize, ultimately what you want to think about is, is there sort of, you know, downstream liquidity, right? Um, so uh, I don't think there's a market for Nicaraguan farmland, right? Uh, but I do think there's a market for Chicago real estate, right? For example, or diamonds uh, or silver or platinum or things like of, of that nature. So the first step is, again, what's the asset being tokenized? The second step is really, um, you know, going through, through a couple sequences of, uh, you know, certifying ownership, running due diligence, understanding what the asset type is, the validity and the authenticity, and sort of validating that asset. Um, and then from there, it moves sort of like towards this, uh, you know, more of an asset tokenization platform that actually manages that tokenization process, the smart contract process, and sort of the administration process, right? Um, and then sort of, you know, it's published on this, on this ledger, on the blockchain. Um, and the last step of that is, is, is essentially that it's, um, that it's sold in, in the market, right? It's distributed. Um, and, and in a nutshell, that's really how it works. There's obviously a bunch of other processes um, here, but uh, for the purposes of, of, of you know, this webinar and, and to make it a bit more digestible, um, this is how we think about, this is what tokenization is, and this is kind of at a very high level how it works. So I have about a thousand questions. I'm sure you're gonna get into them, so I won't jump ahead, but I just wanna, maybe we could talk about real quickly what it token is because we hear it in so many contexts um and i you know when we when when block when kind of crypto kind of started to blow up in 2021 i for the first time i you know digital currencies were being referred to as tokens and there's you know thousands of of tokens out there and i started to realize a token is just 
a representation of something, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's exactly we're talking, what it even is. in the traditional tokenization, like you know, tokenization is a representation of your of your card credentials. So, and the first time I probably ever came introduced to the idea of a token is at the arcade, right? A, a fake coin that represents real money. So I guess that that's helpful and just a representation of something of value, I suppose. Yeah, a token is, is nothing more than just a digital representation to your point of value or a representation that gives you the right uh, to that specific asset, right? Whether it's digital or not. Um, and yes, like in, in, in payments tokenization, that token ends up representing um, you know, a, a 16 digit uh, payment credential, um, or, you know, if you're using Amex, it's 15 digits or, or whatever that may be, but you can have tokens that mask, for example, your social security number, right? And uh, you're sort of moving that token around. And I think that the great thing about, you know, tokenization, I, I would say in general, um, is that to an extent, it makes, it makes, it reduces fraud in the sense that if someone were to take the token, well, they basically took an empty box, right? Because it's a bunch of sort of alphanumeric characters that um, that a fraudster can, can't do much with, right? So I think um, when we think about tokenization at sort of this more grandiose level, um, it, it, it's also very applicable to when we think about asset tokenization, right? Uh, to all sort of the security features yeah. around that. Um, and the fact that it is on a ledger um, and there's sort of multiple points of visibility um, into that specific asset or transaction. So, I have, so let's let's go ahead because I want to unpack this model. Yeah. I think you have a lot more to share with us. So. Yeah, sure. So um, we talked about tokenization uh, being inclusive, right? And what I mean by that is that tokenization is not a technology that you say, "Oh, great, uh, tokenization I can use to tokenize bonds or equities, and that's it." And let's see. Um, you know, the next two guys in a garage with a dog invent a new platform that can tokenize other, you know, types of assets. Tokenization is very open and inclusive in that sense, right? And really any real world asset can, can sort of be represented and shown uh, in a digital form. Um, <clears throat> it could be tracked, traded, sold, borrowed, lent out, um, <clears throat> uh, given out as gifts, you know, <laughs> however you want to think about it. I think what makes tokenization pretty amazing is the fact that again you're taking think about like a house right think about a house in 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 any part of the world that you can tokenize and then that house digitally can move around and the ownership rights to that to that real asset can be just moved around and if you're the owner of that asset you can digitally lend it out uh, for working capital or whatever you may need right so th again that's opens up a whole new um sort of kind of worms into utility that tokenization brings but here it's like real estate, residential, commercial, farmland. Commodities is one that's getting, um, you know, I, I travel a lot to different parts of the world and, and certainly commodities is one that you start hearing more about. Um, obviously in Latin America being historically a very commodity driven region. Um, and how do you help sort of like producers access um, capital and access financial services based on that asset that they hold. Uh, art, obviously, uh, antiques, uh, sculptures, uh, any kind of art piece, uh, even even liter works of literature and things like that. Obviously, currencies, when we talk about tokenizing the US dollar, you have um, USDP, for example, which is, you know, a, a regulated US dollar one for one stable coin. Um, you can tokenize pretty much any currency you want. Uh, and then there's the very huge market of like tokenizing equities and fixed income and other types of securities. Uh, the, the, on the last point, tokenization allows both for public and private securities, right? So if you wanted to tokenize shares of a privately held company, uh, there are processes and, and there is the ability to do that, right? But I think that the key takeaway here is that um, tokenization is sort of like a Swiss army knife in this sense where you, know, you can sort of pop all the different gadgets of a Swiss army knife and you can start a fire or cut down a tree with, with a Swiss Army knife. Tokenization in a way is, is like that. You can tokenize all these different asset classes. And then, as I said, you have much more utility to them uh, because you can use them in, in so many other ways, right? Um, I, remember, next I, yes. I have, sorry, I have a question. Yeah, sure. this. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine before I started working in payments. And he, he said to me that he was living in Chicago and he was working in future markets. 
trading commodities, trading rice, corn, everything, crops. Uh, and I, I thought that was awesome, uh, something that I never heard of until that point. And I'm wondering now, how is tokenization different from trading cops, crops or commodities that have been around in the market for a few years now, or, or maybe better, uh, is this different from what we already had in the past? Yeah, so I think in, in the trading model, uh, and I'm, I, you know, warning in big red, bold and italics, I'm not a trader uh, or, I, or I won't pretend to be one. But um, wh what I think tokenization does do, um, again, we'll use the democratized word again, <laughs> it sort of democratizes access, right? So uh, Sullivan is in San Francisco and Sullivan wants to buy, um, you know, wheat, right, as an investment. How do you buy wheat today, right? It's pretty it's pretty challenging. Uh, I would say nearly impossible for Sullivan to go on, I don't know, Charles Schwab or E-Trade or any and buy wheat, right? Um, but you could open in theory your Mercado Pago app or your new bank app or PayPal at, at some point and see, oh, look, you know, uh, Bitcoin and USDP and I can buy now tokenized wheat, right? Just like I could, I could buy tokenized gold, right? Um, so I think it, 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 to this point mm -hmm. about like opening the financial system, it makes certain assets much more available to retail or downstream markets, right? Typically, um, I'm, I'm sure your friend sort of on the, on, on the trade, on the, you know, um, commodities trading business, he was not trading with, you know, uh, Francisco da Brocha in, in Rio. Uh, he was trading probably with, um, you know, Cargill, right? Uh, or with one yeah. of these sort of big, market maker commodity companies, right? Um, so I think in, in short, um, you know, answering part of, part of uh, your question, it is really about driving access into all these asset classes. Like, could you buy a, a, a Fernando Botero painting today? I, I hope you could, but maybe you can't, right? Um, mm -hmm. But now with tokenization, there's this concept of fractional ownership. You can buy a little piece of that art piece because it's tokenized. People have tokenized it, broken into chunks and sort of, yeah. again, offered it uh, downstream. Oh, perfect. I've got one more, one question. Yeah. yeah. Hang on, let's, have... let's, go, let's let Ruben go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Ruben. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Michael. Uh, just one, one quick question, Arnoldo, and this question is coming from a non-expert of the tokenization and the real <laughs> and the digital world, no? I can understand that you are transferring ownership on a digital world. I can understand how you would transfer ownership in the uh, real world. And thinking about real estate, for example, no? here in the US, if you are transferring a, a real estate property, you go to a title company and that title company transfer the ownership from one to other. No? How that happened from the real world to the digital world? How I transfer my ownership from the real estate from the real world to the digital how would that happen in at the beginning yeah so I, it's very similar to how we today transfer it's very similar today how we transfer for example when we think about cross border remittances and how those are gradually you know moving and being you're beginning to see use cases based on on blockchain um, what essentially tokenization does to transfer ownership it's essentially, obviously the asset is not moved, right? You don't pick up a house and move it across borders. Of course. What is uh -huh. essentially changing, perhaps the, the most simple way to explain it is on this distributed ledger, um, there is a, a property title, if you want. That property title is moving from Arnold to Ruben, right? And that's being published on this distributed ledger, right? Um, so it's essentially an instant, an instant um, transfer of asset um, on a title on the blockchain, right? That's how it occurs. And the same thing happens again, perhaps like this remittance use case or cross-border payments is, is easier to understand. When someone is sending a remittance, a remittance using crypto from the US to, I don't know, uh, to India, for example, um, money is actually not moving. What's essentially happening is just the ownership of a certain amount of tokens is transferring from this person to this person, right? But there's never actually any money, any money moving, it's very similar to, you know, these assets, right? Where it's just an, a, a change of, of ownership, uh, who owns that token and how it's represented 
in sort of this ledger, right? Thank you. Yeah, okay. if I could jump in on a very similar question on that. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in this. I'm actually pursuing my own kind of, you know, business ideas based on this concept of uh, digitizing a, fit, a real world asset. But one thing I've always struggled with is once you, you have a an asset that you have certified as ownership, let's say with you on the blockchain, well, I want to sell that asset. What if the person wants to offer me a price that I'm willing to take for that asset, but has no interest in continuing along the blockchain? How, how do you ensure that everything's in sync? Like um, if this transfer of title from a house to you know, one person or another does not trigger that change of ownership on the blockchain, suddenly you have a conflict that I imagine maybe years down the road, someone can say, well, no, this blockchain says you, this person owns it, whereas this title says, what trumps the other? How do you reconcile these differences over, over the long term? Do, uh, I'm sorry, do you mean in terms of like, if you buy a token that represents, we'll just use an example, uh, an apartment, um, you buy that token and then you want to sell it? Let's, let's use like a fine art, like a piece yeah. of artwork. I own yeah. it. All right, now someone wants to offer me, you know, $500,000. Yep. And I said, well, we've got to do this over the blockchain. You got to get registered here. No, here's $500,000 cash. I'll, I'll let that painting go out the door. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, if I don't reconcile that on the blockchain, there could be conflict down the road. Yeah, but but this is, this is you know, this is, um, this is almost like wanting to accept payment for a tokenized asset in a form that is not on the blockchain and won't be recorded, right? Yes. Um, and, you know, can that happen? Probably, right? But when you're, when you're dealing with tokenized assets, the idea of tokenization is to make sure everything is represented 100% digital. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's like run as fast as you can. You know, if someone's, is, if someone's sort of, in this case, offering you $500,000 in cash for a painting. Um, but it also has to do with the distribution of those tokenized assets, right? So I don't tokenize a painting um, and then sort of walk around and saying, hey, do you want to buy a piece of tokenized painting? And someone will say, here, yeah, sure, here's $100 for that piece. Um, it is completely managed sort of digital and um, part of like, how do you make the market and how do you ensure there's liquidity is again, going back to that first step of ensuring that the asset you're tokenizing does have a market and is liquid, right? Um, yeah. But the idea of tokenization and frankly, the idea of blockchain infrastructure is to move away from sort of these systemic efficiencies of certainly cash and checks and wire transfers and all of that, one. And two, that there is a immutable um, shared recorded history of that specific transaction, right? Yeah, the provenance. That's that's what's got me so interested in this is that there's so many assets that change hands over time. Like I think minerals and crystals, for example, yep. are a good example. That could be 250 to a million dollars, but the provenance of these things are very poor. Yet once you try to take one of these assets to the blockchain, you're really committing to keeping that asset on the blockchain. And that could be a slow transition and can easily get out of sync, I imagine, easily. Yeah, the idea is to obviously move from a, from a sort of having or moving away from all of sort of the challenges and, and burdens and process associated with what you just said, right? Which is like physical transfer of title, paper documents, all of this stuff and move that completely to sort of this ledger um, that is, is much more... Uh, you know, much more efficient, right? From a cost and sort of a, a time uh, point of view. Yeah, I, I struggle with that as well, because we, when you have like currencies or commodities even and shares, like there is a, they're all pretty much the same, like a dollar is a dollar and there's a lot of them. So transferring some dollars from A to B or some grain or whatever it might be is like, okay, there's lots of them, but there's only one apartment that's mine. Um, and it's like, okay, if I'm selling this through, if I put this on a blockchain and I sell it, 
is the blockchain the official system of record of ownership? That becomes a real question. It's like, or is the blockchain a, uh, an alternative? It's like, well, what about a piece of art? Who is the, where is the official system of ownership? Uh, there is like, this is, we're all in the payment industry. This goes back a long way. It's like, there's always got to be uh, a system of record for which yeah. everything else is, um, has to be modified when there's a mismatch, it modifies back to that. Like Visa, for example, on transactions for a lot for Visa transactions. You go back to Visa to just make sure, did we get everything right or have we missed something? It's not that simple, but of course we all know that anyway, we're in this industry. Um, ultimately, ultimately, this is like, what is the ultimate source of truth, right? Exactly. For those, for those sort of transactions. And I think that when you're beginning to see, you know, I'll use Brazil just because kind of like we're, we're involved with, with them down there, but like when you see the Central Bank of Brazil, for example, deciding to tokenize its digital AI and eventually tokenize deposits and a, a bunch of other things, um, you know, in that case, they are sort of, they are setting sort of, or deciding and naming sort of what is that source of truth, right? Uh, for those assets that will be tokenized in Brazil. The, the other part of all of this is that tokenization of assets, um, you know, while companies like Paxos have been around for a long time, this is still at sort of the early stages. And, and I think that's what makes all of this exciting, right? Because the, the sort of standards, I think, in a way have yet to be built. When you look at payment networks, right? Well, they have standards that they're, they're one of the things payment networks are amazing at doing is setting standards, right? Whether that's EMBCO or any other sort of payment standards. Um, there is still a lot to be done here, right? In terms of, great, is there a standard to tokenizing art, right? Or is there a standard to tokenizing real estate? Um, and I'm sure there are a few already, um, but we, we still have a long way to go, I think, overall, uh, before we get to a point where it's, it sort of is running almost like the, the system, the traditional system we see today. Right? Yeah, I, I find that the, uh, the real estate is a really phenomenal use of the blockchain especially for a lot of developing countries, especially in Africa, that are really yeah. trying to play a lot of catch up and are doing really well with it. They don't know who owns anything. When you get outside of the, yeah. the towns, you go to the villages. And so they're starting to track that and having that on a blockchain where it can't be corrupted, but it's also, there's an open record of who owns what. In fact, there's an open record of defining what this piece of real estate actually is. That's a challenge in its own right. Yeah. Then you can say, well, who owns this? Now it's on record. Now, but then a person that sells property doesn't necessarily have to access the blockchain. Whoever they sell through can do it. They can have a broker. The broker does it. That's a really good use of the blockchain. I've always thought ever since I first started hearing about this, that that was a far better use than currencies, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you get you get back. I mean, we could go down this rabbit hole. You get back to sort of the Chilean economist, Hernando Soto or De Soto, who argues that, at least in Latin America, and I'm sure it's applicable to other emerging markets, one of the biggest problems is property titles, right? Um, and has been like ownership of things. You, you go to any of these markets and you, know, you don't know who owns things and there's no records, right? So again, there's a lot to be done, which is why the space is so exciting um, because we're, we're, we're beginning to obviously see a lot of institutional interest. Yeah, and I'd just like to jump in and saying like this kind of thing has got a lot more opportunity in in um, developing countries. I mean that in a much broader term. In the West, we have this kind of uh, ownership structure that's been set up for like decades or even centuries. Um, and so it's difficult to then say, well, we've got to try and change that. We've got to try and merge from this really old archaic system to a new one, how are we gonna do that? But when you're in other countries where, hey, look, we don't have any legacy that we have to deal with. This is great for us here. We can just jump yep. right in on it uh, yep. with this brand new system. I think there's a huge amount of opportunity there. So yeah, I like where you're going. Kind of like Africa leapfrogging the whole PC straight to mobile for payments, right? It's the same. Or, in or even markets. just leapfrogging self, like leapfrogging directly to cell phones because nothing before that would work. Yeah. And they jumped all over it. It's brilliant. Indeed. Great. I think we can oh, move no, uh, on just in lieu yeah, of time. Yeah, let's go ahead. And <laughs> yeah. just one question I want to put in your mind. You, you may get there with your slides, but if there's a, do you already have a, a use case or how, how do people do this? 
Yeah, you know, sure. Let's let's slide. move to the um, next slide. But I want to give you to yeah. Yeah, surprise, surprise. So, for example, let's take gold, right? Um, so, if you wanted to buy gold for your portfolio, um, you know, for most of the folks on this call, it it would be pretty easy. You go onto sort of your your, your broker of choice and you say, well, I want to buy gold for my portfolio. But think of like. 80% of the world that doesn't have access to that and they want to buy gold. And there's certainly some markets around the world um, where gold uh, for centuries has been sort of very ingrained in their culture, right? Uh, as a medium of exchange, a store of value. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Paxos has done, for example, as sort of a, a tokenization company is we've taken physical gold, right? So bullions of gold, and um, we have tokenized physical gold, and that token is called Pax G or Pax Gold, um, where one token essentially represents one fine troy ounce of gold. Um, and that gold is actually held in, in the London Bullion Market Association or LBMA. Um, and if you go to London, there is, you know, in those vaults, the physical gold that is backing up that token, right? And we produce monthly attestations on the gold, all the way down to the serial number of the bullion. Um, so this is a perfect example of something that's like being done today. So once we tokenize that gold, then what we do is, you know, our customers around the world that use, for example, our, our, our crypto brokerage service, when that end user in Brazil or in Argentina or Mexico, wherever they're at, opens up their digital wallet, right? They can buy Bitcoin, US dollar stablecoin. They will have the ability to buy now you know, gold, uh, as little as $20 worth, right? So this is a very practical, real world, uh, existing use case um, that we have today. And we have someone on the team that, you know, has worked in this space for the last 20 or so years uh, in sort of like precious, uh, precious metals and commodities uh, that sort of manages this division within Paxos. Um, and when you think about gold, that's just one sort of like, you know, precious metal, think about platinum and, and all these other things that you can tokenize. But more importantly, think of like how this becomes an example of as real world physical assets that you can tokenize, right? Um, and I believe there's actually been one person that owned uh, a certain amount of uh, Pax Gold tokens that physically went to the LBMA vaults to, you know, exchange it for, for the physical gold, right? So um, not something very common to do. But, uh, but, but I understand there, there was one, one case around that, right? So when going back to that regulated entity status, you wanna make sure that the company that's tokenizing and taking custody of these assets is obviously regulated um, because there's an immense amount of trust that has to go into, well, is your customer buying $20 worth of gold and it's kind of an empty warehouse full of you know, empty barrels or or is it true like a vault, in this case, LBMA in, in, in London, right? No, I so, think you hit on one of the, the two big questions. One of them is, is, is it for real? I know yeah. from years yeah. years ago that I, there were some legitimate uh, crypto gold tied to gold, and I knew some of them that were blatantly fake, and they were just trying to scam people of money. But the other side of it yeah. is if this becomes too easily available, could this end up becoming something that could be used as a currency and therefore bypassing the fiat currencies in each country and therefore causing friction um, where central banks start getting, like trying to shut you down because it's they're, you're bypassing them. So is that something that is of concern? Well, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, this adds a little bit more transparency, right? Um, I, I think in the end, the biggest challenge that governments have had is um, not having visibility and reporting into, you know, financial transactions. And, you know, the culprit of that has been cash, right? Um, and cash and sort of like all the other methods of moving value uh, that don't get reported. Um, and I, we, we believe sort of like, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of uh, discussion around uh, blockchain anonymous all of that but you know you have um, blockchain monitoring solutions now that focus on sort of like uh, compliance and control and reporting and transaction monitoring and you know whether it's chain analysis or trm or cypher trace or whatever um, so i think in the end it does provide uh, 
you know, a, a way to move from analog to digital. And by doing so, you do provide a little bit more visibility to, to governments, right? But yes, you know, there's that, a lot that of- wasn't, sort of That wasn't really my, my concern so much. What I'm, here's an example. Um, Argentina has over 100% inflation. Yep. If everybody in Argentina could start using gold instead through yep. this, and it was just easily available, then everyone would bail out of Argentinian currency and it would collapse. Yep, uh, because no one would want it. That that's a threat to the Argentinian government and central bank. That's what I was yep. thinking of. Is if if it's freely available, it becomes a real threat because everyone knows what gold is. Now, a lot of people don't know what Bitcoin is, but everyone knows what gold is. Yeah, correct. And there's a lot going on. Argentina is a very interesting case. Uh, we could get into that, you know, offline. But um, you know, in the end, it's it is. Um, you know, it's, it's in the end of the day, it's like, what will consumers and businesses use that has the least amount of friction, not necessarily like how they can hide and things like that, but it's what, what gets the job done. Right. Um, and that's kind of how we're seeing, how we're seeing things move. I want to go to the next slide. Cause I know we have a uh, little time left. So high level sort of benefits of tokenization. We've spoken a lot about these. So I won't go into this nitty gritty details, but obviously efficiency um, sort of everything from atomic settlement to instant delivery with payment and how quickly those things can happen. Um, liquidity, again, this concept of fractionalization, you can have an asset and drive more liquidity uh, for that asset given sort of a bunch of, um, you know, downstream consumers or institutions that are, that are uh, willing uh, to, to acquire that asset. Transparency, uh, compliance, obviously, as I said, I, I mentioned three sort of of these uh, blockchain uh, monitoring uh, companies that help bring a little bit more sense of compliance. And remember, at the end of the day, sort of um, certain blockchains are, 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 are open in a sense in that you have sort of a bunch of different parties having real-time visibility into transactions. Obviously, innovation, if, if there's one of the few areas in blockchain infrastructure that is that is uh, incredibly exciting to be in. I, I think as, as, as someone that works in a company, you know, at the forefront of this or as an investor or as an entrepreneur, um, certainly this concept of tokenization uh, is, is I think at the early, early days and obviously reduced costs. Um, you know, anytime there's human labor involved, there is a, an impediment in, in, in how much you can scale uh, and how much you can reduce your cost base and things like that. And we believe that tokenization is certainly um, able to to sort of have an impact on on overall like costs of, of transactions right next slide please addressable market um you know today sort of it's like around a trillion digital assets market depends what day you you look at the numbers uh but really the next if you hit uh great but really like there's over 700 trillion in assets uh that can be tokenized right so the market is is truly truly immense um and we're at the early, early days. So when you think about, you know, uh, tokenizing uh, commodities or, or, or any other sort of type of agricultural or um, product, for example, just that market alone is, is massive. When you think about currencies, when you think about the fixed income equities market, uh, someone, I think, Nick, you were speaking about like real estate, like just think about the size of those asset classes, right? Um, and even if you're able to tokenize a percentage of that, um, at the aggregate level, you're talking about this massive global market of different assets, right? Um, the next slide, please. Today and tomorrow, sort of, um, you know, again, in the next seven years or so, um, sort of like we're still going to be in the very early days, right? There, this is a BCG study that 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 came out. Um, two or three quarters ago talking about sort of tokenization and, and sort of what, what the next seven years look like. And it's a $16 trillion market by, by 2030. Um, and if you hit there, the next uh, buttons, please. Um, and these are some of the existing tokenization use cases that, that exist today. Um, and just some of the companies that I personally have been in touch with and, and you know, speak with the founders here and there, and, and they're very interesting. Um, Two of them are, are LATAM. Uh, Macondo is, a, is an early stage company and they're tokenizing US real estate uh, and then offering sort of fractionalized ownership uh, to uh, people in Latin America, starting with Colombia. 
And if you look at sort of the Colombian peso uh, over the last year and sort of like how it's depreciated against the dollar, uh, the demand for US dollar uh, assets, whether it's dollars or any other thing that gives you a, a yield is, is, uh, is very hard, is very high. So Macondo is, a, is again, a company doing that. I'm sure many of you have heard of Agro Token uh, on this call. Um, you know, Agro Token is, a, is an Argentine company um, and they're very interesting because they've, they've uh, been able to, to co uh, commoditize and create tokens on soy and wheat and a few other um, agricultural commodities. And what this is doing is it's actually helping uh, both sides of sort of the market. It's helping financial institutions deliver and drive more consumption of financial services to, to folks in, in agriculture. Uh, because they do now have, in a way, collateral, which are these uh, commodity-backed tokens. Uh, and it's also helping producers, right? Uh, if you think about agriculture, um, it's an, one of the hardest um, industries to be in because you're, you're exposed to so many different variables, some which are uncontrollable. Uh, but now these producers um, can sort of, if they have uh, in, in their silos or in their warehouses commodity products, you know, they have tokens now uh, through through this tokenization platform called Agro Token, and now they can access a bunch of different uh, financial services uh, based on, on their products. And then uh, Artery is, is one based in Europe, and this is really about um, how they've begun tokenizing very expensive fine art um, and working with some of the, the most well-known uh, auction and sort of authentication houses around the world to tokenize uh, everything from you know Picassos to Basquets um, and making that again, accessible um, in, in this case, still to sort of an affluent base, but not affluent enough where you can just go out and buy a Picasso, right? So again, uh, all of these companies, this is what we're beginning to see. And um, over time, I think what you'll see is kind of this like supermarket of tokenization companies. Some have been, you know, very uh, narrow and deep and focusing on a specific asset class. And then I think what you'll see is, um, you know, platforms like Paxos that are in a way agnostic and sort of we we are a regulated infrastructure blockchain infrastructure company that will tokenize a bunch of different assets right so um so again very exciting uh, still in the early days but certainly uh lots of lots of smart people and, and lots of money going into the space and more than vc money you're seeing institutional players like the very big global banks get into this stuff um that's so, interesting yeah. Arnaldo, on that on that last before we get to your final thoughts, yeah. the, the agro token use case remind you know it's it's targeting a, a class of people as you said really hard industry to be in very often financially excluded. So I wanted to kind of go to Rodrigo's question in the chat here on that note. Um, he's asking, um, you know, under what conditions or requirements? do you think we could consider tokenizing inventories or formal sales for small businesses as collateral to improve their risk profile? Have you seen that being done? Do you see that as, a, as, I, a, as, a, as I, an opportunity? I haven't seen it being done, uh, but that's not to say it can't be done and it shouldn't be done, right? And I think one of the, I was having a conversation, I, um, I forget with who, <laughs> was that on airport lounge recently, but um, we were talking about one of the biggest opportunities for tokenization is actually for the small business segment, right? Um, which is the segment that deals mainly with like liquidity crunch um, and a whole sorts of issues, right? That have to do with, with cash flow. Um, and some of, some of the SMB sectors are seasonal, right? Um, so they'll have ups and downs through certain periods of the year. And then they need working capital for kind of like those dry spell months, right? Um, can they, in a way, digitize um, inventory uh, or in, including like future receivables, right? Uh, there's a, a bank in Brazil, I believe it was Bradesco, that tokenized like receivables, right? Um, so there's a, there's a whole, so again, you can sort of think about tokenization as, as a Swiss army knife of sorts in the sense that it, it can address a bunch of different um, use cases and moving value, uh, but it can also... Um, help a lot of different types of companies in different parts of the world access more liquidity um, by tokenizing a certain asset that they that they have. Right? Mm -hmm. But SMB, I think if you think about, obviously I'm biased, Latin America, um, think about how many small and medium businesses and even large companies could tokenize part of the receivables, right? Um, 
um, or inventory or, or hard assets, right? Um, and in a way, it's kind of like agro token. Yeah, unlocking right? liquidity, right? Yeah. yeah. In, in yeah. Liquidity. Agro token, right. like, you know, does that for like small farmers, right? Or medium sized farmers. So right? think of those are SMBs. Now you can do that outside right. the commodity space, right? So it's, again, very interesting. I think what, you know, if you're, if you're curious and, and you're, you sort of are passionate about this intersection of technology and finance, like tokenization is certainly um, one of those very interesting uh, areas to be in. Okay, terrific. All right, let's go think, ahead to your, I think you have one more slide here. Yeah, the last slide is, uh, again, just some final thoughts. Like, you know, I, I think tokenization in general is going to unlock this massive like economic value um, across the system, uh, across all markets, across different segments of the markets. Um, as I said, there's like a ton of opportunities right now, whether it's like tokenizing, whether it's serving as a custodian of tokenized assets, where it's adding a layer of value added services um, to the tokenization process. And third, I think um, we're entering a, a technology super cycle. Um, and we enter these like, you know, once in a while, obviously like web one and then cloud. Um, Obviously, you know, I think blockchain and AI will certainly be in, in the mix as we as we potentially look at this technology super cycle, which is um, which is probably, you know, uh, coming at some point uh, soon. Right. Um, so it, it's it'll be interesting to see uh, tokenization's place there, but certainly we'll, we'll certainly be in the mix. I um, love that term technology super cycle because you, you can feel it building. You can feel yeah. it happening, yeah. and, and there are use cases all over the place where this is art. But at the mass global scale, it hasn't quite yet been up overturned. But but certainly yeah. Yeah. we're, you, we're you, on the way. Yeah, you know, uh, it's one of these things, and you have to be patient. Technology super cycles, like you know, uh, they'll go, they'll experience winters, and then people say, "Oh, that thing's not going to work." The same thing happened in the late '90s, you know, with with the internet and. Uh, I don't think we'd be talking here without the internet. So again, you, you'll sort of see these things, but definitely a lot of momentum around tokenization and a few other um, key topics circling, making their way around the, the industry. Fantastic. Well, Arnold, thank you. This is really just an intro. I mean, this is goes so deep and there's so much to learn. I think we could, uh, you know, have multiple conversations on this topic and we certainly will as, as you know, this super cycle progresses. So, but thank you so much. I, you know, I so appreciate your time and giving us an intro on this topic. I, if, especially Rodrigo or anyone else wants to reach out to, to Tornolo, you have the information there as well as LinkedIn. Um, and so thank you, Arnaldo, for sharing with us. And we're excited to see what where Paxos goes and where you take where you take this, this idea of tokenization, along with all the other, you know, multiple services that you guys offer. So thank you so much. Really appreciate your time.